Are you looking to optimize your health? Are you looking to get the best supplements at the lowest price? For high quality supplements and to talk to someone about what supplements are best for you, go to takeyoursupplements.com and one of our fantastic true health coaches will help you pick out the right supplements for you that are the highest quality and the best price. That's takeyoursupplements.com. Takeyoursupplements.com. That's takeyoursupplements.com. Be sure to ask about free shipping and our awesome referral program. Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 285. Well, today we have with us a wonderful, inspiring guest. This is going to be one of those feel-good episodes, which I love so much. Because, you know, we talk about a lot of really heavy topics. And it's so great to have someone who's going to inspire us and motivate us and share uh, some beautiful stories. It, it Also, she's a podcaster as well, which we love. I've got a brand new podcast to introduce you guys to. And you are just going to love her show Melissa Monty, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. So tell us about, first of all, what led you in your life to to where you are today? You have this gorgeous podcast called Mind Love, and you discuss, you know, mindset shifts and modern mindfulness. Uh, you go through these gorgeous raw stories and you know, personal experiences and, and inspiring interviews. Um, your background, which aligns with uh, many of our listeners, uh, because your background is in you know, Reiki and yoga. Uh, but then you also have done other things like um, free fall skydiving. We definitely want to hear about that. And um, and so you have that holistic uh, part of uh, what you do. And then you, you're really focusing on that mind body connection. Yes. I, I, that's always, that's was my side hobby for a really long time. And I was working in tech. So, uh, I, I was working for tech startups a lot, but it's actually been really helpful for what I'm doing now, just with digital marketing and kind of spreading my message. So it's been a really good, like symbiotic relationship of skills. Very cool. Awesome. Well, so what led you to want to launch mind love your podcast? It was a pretty long journey of getting here, but basically I, I grew up with a really great childhood. I had great parents, a support system, all of that. And then when I was a teenager, several traumas hit back to back. I was raped twice. I um, had a really close friend commit suicide and my dad died. And I was so ill-equipped to deal with this kind of trauma I had a little bit of a background of just like, you know, positive thinking, not really a background so much as my mom was involved in a book club. And so I would just kind of take some of the books that she had and read them, even if she wasn't like I read the five love languages when I was like 12. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so part of me just thought that I could ignore or or rise above some of the painful feelings that I was feeling and just keep a happy face. And, and I was going to college and partying a lot. And from the outside, people wouldn't really know that I was struggling so much. They might've realized that I was a huge party girl, but they wouldn't have known really what the root of what I was trying to escape was. And because of ignoring some of those issues that I had been dealing with, it started to manifest in my life in other ways. I developed a really dangerous eating disorder. I was bulimic for eight years, and there were days that I wouldn't even leave my room just binging and purging hundreds of dollars worth of food. I I was attracting negative people into my life, and at one point, I even found myself in jail for my ex-boyfriend's crime, and I had no idea how I had even gotten there, didn't even fully realize what I was arrested for. Being blamed for this thing it ended up being a two-year legal battle. It was a mess. So I had really hit rock bottom, and I knew I had to do something. And I just started taking baby steps, reading books, following 
advice from some of the world's most successful people, finding the common denominators of everything that they were teaching. And then I started applying it to my life and it wasn't an overnight change whatsoever. It was like a decade of, of growth and I'm still growing, but it started to become important to me to share those things that I had done. People started asking me, they started noticing big differences and, and eventually I ended up doing the work to really figure out what my passion was and it all led back to these kind of transformative things. And so I did some steps to really realize my, my full purpose, which we can get into in a minute. But, um, but I, yeah, I, I did the work. I tried a bunch of other things that weren't quite my passion, weren't quite in line. And I thought I was, and so I had to go back to square one and really figure that out. And once I did, um, I, everything's been different in the last year. Everything feels so much more meaningful to me. And it's so easy to keep my goals now and to keep making progress because it is so in line. And that's really what Mind Love Podcast uh, came about from was just sharing those tips that really changed my life. I love it. So real like boots on the ground stuff that really works. Yes. I'd love for you to share some examples of of what really works, especially like, um, losing a, I've lost both my parents. So I know losing a parent is, is so traumatic and takes years to really get over. Um, and, and then of course being assaulted and then, you know, (laughs) I mean, everything you, you illustrated there, uh, is, you know, could, could potentially scar someone for life if they didn't go through the work to heal and to gain the positive learnings and to resolve that within themselves. Can you give us some examples or some steps of things that, that, that have really helped you to gain clarity and resolution? Yes. And there are actually so many, but I I tackled one at a time and some of the first ones, because I think it's important to to start where you can, because it's not like all of a sudden, like, I'm like, oh, I want to make these changes. And then suddenly I'm following routines and setting goals. Like that's too much all at once. (laughs) And so one of the first things was forgiveness. When my, when my dad died, uh, so my parents had been divorced since I was really, really young. I don't really remember a time when they were together. So I was used to having divorced parents. I always was kind of grateful for it. I remember thinking at a really young age that I'm so grateful for my stepdad. I have a great stepdad, but that my dad was the fun one and he wasn't really a provider. And so for like a seven-year-old to know the word provider, that's kind of weird anyways, but when you need to know a word, you kind of do. And so, um, yeah, my, my dad didn't have custody over me, so he was always helping people through AA and NA. He was sober my whole life other than the first couple of years of it. And, and so it was important for him to like kind of be in areas where it it made people that he was helping feel comfortable. So he'd normally live in kind of the ghetto. And I felt very resentful towards him for a long time because I'm like, my other friends are going to their dad's house on the weekends and it's a bigger house or it's a a spot that people can come over. And I don't want people to come over to your house. You live in a duplex with some guy named crazy Carl who just got out of rehab. And it's like, and so it was all about trips with him. Anyways, I didn't have this like solid foundation of a relationship with him quite as much as some other people. And I would envy like daddy's girls and stuff like that. And that started to change. So I became older, but then, uh, when he was diagnosed with cancer, I really made more of an effort, but it was still a really big change from what I had been used to. And I went and visited him and he was finally moved to a hospice center and it was so hard. I, I laid there next to him. He could barely talk and I held his hand and I, I, he, he fell asleep and I kind of fell asleep. And my stepdad came to pick me up and told me it was time to fly back to college. And I just broke down in the, in the parking lot. And the next week, my, my aunt said, you know, you might want to come back and visit and uh, your dad's not doing so well. And I, 
just thought it'd be too hard. I was crying for days after I got home. I feel like I just got back to school and got back into my routines and, and then I was supposed to fly back. So I said no. And he died that weekend alone. And so I, I had so much guilt over not going there over being the only one in my dad's life. Like I was my dad's everything. Uh, at his funeral, a lot of things became clear to me. A lot of the resentments I held over what he was choosing to do with his life, because at one point he was in real estate and really successful. And, and then all of a sudden I'm like, why do you just want to focus on, on NA and AA and recovery stuff? And I really just thought he was trying to escape responsibility because he could just camp whenever he wanted. And then like 50 homeless people showed up to his funeral and they all got up tons of them got up and shared stories and gave me like an NA beanie that my, he had spent all his money washing and wanted to give it to me because my dad gave it to him like 15 years before. And it was just like this moment of clarity, but it kind of added to my guilt of never understanding. So one of the first steps I really had to do was forgive myself for that. And to know that I did the best that I could at the time. Forgiveness is such a big part of any change because without forgiveness, then you're going to be repeating negative thought patterns in your head all the time. You're going to be talking yourself down. And I had to do the same thing with the suicide. Why my friend had said he was going to commit suicide for years. But when you're a teenager, you're like, why are you doing this? Like, why? Like, it seemed like an attention getting thing, you know, and I thought I could be there more than I could, but I didn't know I was 15, like how I had to forgive myself for that. And the rape, I blamed myself. It, it was the very first night I had ever drank. I was not conscious. I woke up to it and there was a crowd of people around at that. And I just thought, well, I drank too much. I did this. It took me until the Me Too movement really came out, until that Brock Turner case to understand that that wasn't my fault. And I have chills right now because I ended up finally grieving at in my late 20s for that first instance. And like I said, I was raped twice. And so the other one I knew of, I knew was rape, but that one I, I didn't identify with. And so everything's a process, but the more I grow to that, the more I realize is just how important it is to have compassion for yourself. And once, once I did, then I started to change my thought patterns. And then that opened the door for all of the other changes that started to mean a lot to me, like building routines and finding your passion and, 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 um, understanding how the brain works and working with that instead of against it and feeding your body to really excel your energy and, and all the little things add up. Tell us a bit about how the, how the brain works. What did you discover um, about how the brain works that'll, that allows you to make changes easier or make like these habits and these shifts easier once you understood how the brain works? Well, one of the books that really, really helped me was called The Power of Habit, because when I was at my lows, I was really just taken over by so many negative habits. And and these habits, they're, they're bigger than habits. Some of them, like when you think of bulimia, bulimia is a series of activities that you do over and over again. And it is it's a habit, but it's a habit that really takes over your life into like a psychological disorder. But I. I started to realize triggers and what was what was happening right before that and right after that. And so at my worst, I had I not only had the habit of, of binging and purging um, and I I hesitate in calling it a habit because eating disorders are just so much deeper than that. But but on the on a base level, it is. And I also used to like bite my nails down to where they would bleed and it was my biggest insecurity and I just couldn't figure out how to stop. And, and I had, you know, all the other little negative habits before you really start achieving your goals and, and things like that. But I started to read about, about changing, kind of disrupting these circuits that you put your brain into and seeing if maybe just this once you can, you can kind of disrupt that and choose something else. Or what is it that I'm getting 
Like what sensation am I craving when I'm like peeling my fingernails off, you know? And, and in the book, they give a really good example of when you find yourself doing that, try to find a different sensation, like squeezing the edge of a table or, or something like that. And, and so I started to just experiment with what, what worked for me. But I think the biggest, biggest, biggest thing that really started to positively influence my, my changes were developing positive routines. Routines are interesting because when you, you can read like the miracle morning or something like that. And it talks about all these awesome things you can do in the morning. But if you try to put them all in your new routine at once, it's going to be (laughs) really overwhelming and impossible. Mm -hmm. So I like to do the replacement method and just change one small thing that's doable. The same thing works if you're changing your diet. Like I went vegan and I started, I started being mostly vegan and, and just making like the small step, like maybe just changing your breakfast. And so Mm -hmm. the very first thing that I added to my routine that was helpful was my gratitude journal. I used to use the five minute journal. I really love tools. I can talk about (laughs) tools that have helped me all day long, but the first one was the five minute journal, which I had found out about through Tim Ferriss. And it just causes you to start to focus on the good things that are happening in your life. Cause we get into all these negative loops all the time, no matter what we're doing. And, and so when you start to write down what you're grateful for in the morning and at night, then your brain starts seeking these things out through the day. And then you're shifting your focus mm. towards what, Oh, Oh, maybe I can write this down in my gratitude journal tonight. And you start seeking out these things to be grateful for. Instead of seeking out things to complain about, which is kind of how we're hardwired. Yes. And, and, and just like criticizing ourselves and, and like walking past a mirror and being like, ah, oh, I just sucking in and I, I can lose five pounds or, oh, I just wish my hair wasn't like this or, oh, I wish this instead when I, I still do that all the time. I'm human. And so the difference is now that when I notice myself doing that, I will make a conscious effort to say something different. Mm-hmm. If I, if I realize that I'm saying, oh, I look fat today. I will stop and actually say out loud in a lot of cases, like you are beautiful just the way you are. You are not your body. Like you are so much more than that. So don't let your body bring you down like things like that. And, um, yeah, I really recommend baby steps and, and experimentation. I love that you pointed out like the steps that took you to be go vegan. I'm like, I'm right there. I'm like, mostly vegan which is kind of like saying i'm half pregnant because it's because the word vegan is so strict it's like no animal products ever right and i started out with like okay let's try one meatless meal i have gone into this entire thing kicking and screaming i loved meat there were there were there were entire meals that didn't have any plants at all it was just like animal products on my you know meat only right and i was like I just, in my mind, it was this big, scary thing. Like it just seemed this idea of going from literally meat at every meal to being no meat at every meal was too much because it's like, well, what, what am I going to eat? And how am I going to shop? And what am I going to cook? And what if I go out? And what if I go to a friend's house? And if there's all these steps, like you said, don't try to do it all at once. Like there's so many steps to changing your diet, no matter what change, whether you're going, you know, to be more plant-based or whether like whatever your change you're making, it just, it, there take, there's take so many different steps. So much, so much consideration because your routine during the week may be totally different than your routine on the weekends. Um, and, or routines, a routine on a day that you're really busy versus routine on days that you're home. So there's all these different variables that you need to learn how, like in advance, how, what kind of strategies are you going to put in place? And so I love that you said, Start with, for example, if you're going to go more plant-based or go vegan, like just have a meatless meal. Just have one meal with no meat. I don't care what you eat. Just don't have any animal products on your plate and just see how that goes for you. And then, and then you take that one step further and one step further. I was already dairy free. So we just went, okay, I'm cutting out all meat. And now I've got this, the one last thing I have to give up are eggs. And so I'm just like, okay, I've got to figure out like, what am I going to do instead of eggs? And then I'll be able to <laughs> give it up completely. Um, but I'm loving it. I'm loving it. And I think it. you're so right. Do it in steps, do it in baby steps and totally forgive yourself and don't beat yourself up. Um, 
don't let other people beat you up and really don't beat yourself up. I think we beat ourselves up more. We get, we bully ourselves way more than we get bullied out there in the world. Um, we really should look at our relationship that we have with ourself. Like it's a separate person talking to us and then not, and then not allow that bullying go, Hey, like when you catch yourself bullying yourself, go, Hey, I don't let other people talk to me like that. Why would I let myself talk to me like that? Yeah, for sure. We, don't even take that into consideration a lot of times is what we're saying to ourselves. And so stop and say, wait, if somebody was saying this to my little sister or to my mom or to my best friend, how would I react? And what? And if they did, then how would I go in and, and try to make them feel better? Well, stop and be that person for yourself as well. And it's funny that you said you gave up eggs you're, you've still got to work on eggs. Eggs is the last thing I gave up as well. My husband was so good at making breakfast sandwiches with eggs that I was so reluctant. I'm like, oh my God, but then what is he going to cook? <laughs> and it's funny because now he's got his signature, what we call a superfood scramble. And um, I make a lot of things in bulk because um, I don't like buying processed foods and stuff like that either. So I have a pressure cooker, which is really a godsend as a vegan. And so you I make beans and quinoa and just keep it in the fridge. And he makes these like amazing superfood scrambles with kale and nutritional yeast and, and spices. Oh. And it's so good. Can we have so a rest? Yeah, can we have his recipe? To... <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I will share it with you, but yeah, nice. it's like, we just kind of put as many things as we can. I love like coconut aminos um, mm. as a little dressing and, and a nutritional yeast with some flax seeds, and it's just delicious. Nutritional yeast is the best. I put it in every, I make cheesy rice. You know, you just basically, so I love what you said about pressure cooker. Um, I actually, I, so I have a pressure cooker, but you know what I found out I use more is this, I got it off Amazon. I'll link it in the show notes. It's this tiny little three cup rice cooker. And, and the reason why I like it is that, um, well, first of all, when it cooks, by the time it cooks three cups of rice, it's actually enough. Like it's, I do like brown basmati, organic brown basmati, for, for example. And by the time it's, it cooks three cups, uh, it turns into six cups, right? Because it's three cups of dry. So now it's six heaping cups of, of, um, you know, this brown basmati. Uh, and that's totally enough for, for two to three days. Um, but I like it because it takes up very little space on the counter and it's so cute and it's just one button. So I just put the water and put the rice or I, or it makes quinoa. It makes the perfect quinoa. It actually better than my pressure cooker. It makes perfect quinoa and you just put the stuff in there and then you hit the down button for cook and just leave it there. And I love how cute and small it is, how easy it is to clean. And so what I, and it, t it cooks in about like, you know, 20 minutes. And so I just come into the kitchen. I go, oh, I got to make something for dinner. And now I've made enough like quinoa or rice for the next three days. And, um, and so I just love this tiny little cooker, even though I love my pressure cooker, it's just kind of just giant and, and, you know, takes up a lot of space. And then I usually make beans for like an entire week. It's sort of like when I want to make giant bulk level amount. Um, but yeah, I love kitchen tools. My latest kitchen tool, I don't know if you've tried it. It seems so gimmicky, but it is epic. It's the, it's this spiralizer by, um, you know, the, the bullet, the people that make the bullet, it's the magic bullet. They make the veggie bullet. Have you heard of the veggie bullet? I have heard of the veggie bullet and I don't have that, but I you do have to. a different, a manual spiralizer yeah. that I love. And oh my gosh, making noodles out of carrots or noodles yeah. out of zucchini or sweet potatoes even. Oh, so yes. Good. It's so, it's so much fun to try to, it's like, I basically look around going, oh, and that you can make, uh, out of the stems of broccoli, you can make, uh, noodles. And what's great is, you know, for your, for kids, like my three-year-old, I'm like, yeah, these are just new news. These are noodles. Just eat them. <laughs> it's carrots and broccoli and zucchini. It's so great. Um, so yeah, I love, I love playing with those gadgets. Um, what, what other, what other kitchen gadget is your absolute favorite? I love my little, uh, well, my two favorites because I make a matcha latte every single morning and, um, and so my mom got me this really cute, like electric kettle, but it's like a really beautiful glass one. Mm. And so I, I heat up my water with that, but I also have this Breville frother. That is so awesome. <laughs> I just put, put my almond milk or lately I've been having a lot of flax milk or even pea milk. It's mm. a little bit um, thicker and froth it. The thing is, is that it doesn't get quite as like the 
the really good milks don't quite get as frothy. <laughs> well, the really good alternative milks, I should right. say. And so, uh, um, but it still warms it up and kind of fluffs it a little bit. And um, I live for those. That and also my my uh, food processor is, is a godsend for like making hummus and, and different sauces and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I'm such a big fan of Breville that um, I've been slowly creating a Breville um, in like in the entire set, basically, like maybe once every six months, I'll buy a Breville item. And so I've been slowly building this giant kitchen of Breville products and replacing the other ones. I love it. I love them so much. Uh, I've never had a problem with a Breville. I've never have had a Breville breakdown. Um, re- like I just, I love them and I love their, they have a special Breville tea kettles, like this glass one that, um, it's a it has a magnetic uh canister that holds the loose tea and then you hit you tell it you program it you're like okay this is black or this is herbal or you know you tell it exactly what it is and then it knows it heats up the water and then it knows when to slowly dunk it in the water and then it knows when to pull it back out of the water and uh and it's none of it's plastic it's all you know metal or glass um and it's just it's it's just the coolest thing ever uh, but you're tell me about why you drink maca tea. Is it like super healthy? Did you notice any health changes? Uh, did you like switch from coffee? Yeah, it's a it's matcha latte. Matcha. Uh, uh, yeah, and um, I discovered matcha. I mean, I think I had had a matcha latte before, but when I was living in New York, um, I, my husband and I had kind of moved there on a whim. We were road tripping the United States for nice. months. We had sold all of our stuff and. We landed in New York and I was like, I just need to get to know New York. Let's stay here. And so we found a little room as newlyweds, like living with like four other people in this little shoebox of a room. And at first I was kind of miserable, like I always am when I move to a new place. But normally the first three months are pretty hard. But then I found my perfect morning routine is when I find my routines. And so I would go... I would skateboard. I'd put on three pairs of pants because it was cold and skateboard to yoga and back. And I'd stop at this place called Matcha Bar. And Matcha Bar had the most delicious matchas I've ever had in my life. But on the wall, they kind of had the description of, of why it is, why it's better than coffee. And it's just a different type of um, caffeine. It's an like almost like an extended release. You don't get jittery. There are, it's a green tea, so you get all the benefits of green tea. And um, one of the reasons that I had switched to veganism was because, so I had healed, I had been recovered from my eating disorder for about six months. And then I all of a sudden started having these crazy painful stomach aches Mm. and I was, I was like bedridden for a few days and it was so uncomfortable. I remember being snowboarding and having to stop and I was like crying, feeling like I was going to, um, feeling like I was going to throw up. Like, you know, when you, your tongue kind of starts salivating and you're Mm -hmm. just like, Oh my God. And so it was like that. But then all of a sudden I would sneeze and it would subside. And it was such an obvious, like weird link because it happened a few <laughs> times where I was like going to vomit all over myself. And then all of a sudden I'd sneeze and it'd go away. So I Googled and I found this forum of people talking about it. And it and it was about chronic gastritis. And that was caused through an eating disorder. And so I went to the doctor and all this stuff. And they basically said, like, I had damaged my stomach so much that I would probably be living with this my whole life. I... I had to make a lot of different changes. And one of those was coffee. Would Coffee would really irritate it because it was acidic. And so that's when I first switched to matcha lattes. But then thankfully, when I switched to a vegan diet, within six weeks, my stomach issues were like completely cleared up. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just recent that it kind of flared up again a little bit. But um, it was also after getting food poisoning. And so I had like thrown up a few times for the first time in a while. <laughs> uh, not on my own accord, though. And uh, just eating while traveling. And, and so it did kind of flare up. So I guess, I mean, there's still... There's still something there, but I don't normally deal with it on a day-to-day basis mm. through diet changes. So I would say this is just intuitive hit. Go to a um, homeopathic practitioner. That's one thing that like you're doing everything right on the physical plane and homeopathic medicine is energetic medicine. So you may want to, you may see, uh, or th- that or 
acupuncture. Um, cause sometimes these like weird symptoms that come about the body kind of like, for example, feeling nauseous, then salivating, then sneezing, then it going away. That can be an energetic expression of what's going on in the physical plane. So that's, that's something to always like, like look at, okay, cause you're doing everything. You're doing everything in terms of diet and you know, stress management and everything. And then sometimes we need like that on an energetic level, like homeopathy, um, or as you know, Reiki or acupuncture to kind of just bring our energetic body back into balance. Uh, but it's great. I love your story because so many people would either just write it off or start taking an over the counter drug or just take whatever their MD said as the end all be all. And you were like, no, I'm going to keep looking. I'm going to keep exploring. You're advocating for yourself. And through that, you're, you're just one of those people that keeps growing no matter what. And I think that's why listening to your podcast is so powerful for us because a leader like you, who is always looking to learn and grow and then share that growth and share that information, share what you learned, um, helps us all grow. I feel like when people like growing like that excites me so much. Like I love it. And so I don't really understand how to be another way, because if you, <laughs> if you are the type that isn't trying to grow and isn't realizing how much capacity we have to be whoever we want to be or to, to learn what we want to learn, then you're just kind of accepting what you feel you were dealt. But the purpose of this life is to grow, in my opinion, in a lot of people's opinions. And it's just, there's so much to explore and you're a different person. Each passing moment, your cells are changing. Your cells completely are, have completely renewed every seven years, which is why I think some people have have like the seven years in relationships. If you're not growing together, then, then literally on a cellular level, you're a completely different person than you were seven years before. So to realize that we have a choice in that different person that we want to be. And when we put our minds to something that we can evolve to be bigger, better, more than we previously thought is just really exciting for me. That's awesome. What now you're, you're, your website, which is mindlove.com, and you've got this awesome, you've got some amazing episodes. Um, can people like work with you? Like, how do you, I don't mean to be so blunt, but how do you make money? Like, like, can we hire you? Do you work with people? How, do, how does it work? Well, right now I'm focusing a lot on building my audience. And so I, I was vice president of a startup until March. And so I started my podcast as a side hustle. And mm. I have my bigger goal in mind. And thankfully, my husband's company needed work with the marketing side. And so I've been filling in there for extra money. But right now, um, yeah, I've just been trying to be as strategic as possible and use some of my digital growth strategies to just build that up. And um, my ultimate goal is to give one of the most inspiring uh, speeches on the TED talk stage. So oh, I've been working towards that. And nice. um, I joined Toastmasters, which is everywhere. And it's yes. awesome. And it's been around since like the forties or something crazy. And, um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm, I'm just working on becoming a better speaker and learning more and, and talking to people and building my network. And it's been such a joy. I love Toastmasters. When did you start doing it? It was my New Year's resolution, and so my my class is on Wednesdays, and so it was the very first Wednesday after January 1st, I believe it was the third, that I went to my first Toastmasters meeting, and, and it's so much fun. It's, it's the concept of deliberate practice. There's this book that I love called Peak, and it's like the science of, of basically learning and getting better, and it talks about... Um, the importance of actually like recording yourself doing something and and finding somebody who's already accomplished that and getting feedback from them and and getting feedback right after you do something so that you can you can apply it immediately and you can identify those things mm -hmm. so many of us just start to practice something and and you just keep doing it over and over again it's like i know people say practice makes perfect but it doesn't always the right kind of practice makes perfect and so 
it's interesting. It's a, it's an almost an old school format, but it is, it really works. And there's a lot of people that have, that, um, have pretty inspiring stories and Toastmasters. And so they even have evaluators right after your speech, they've got table topics. So you get impromptu learning, you can fill a different role every class. So it's, it's really fun. I just brought a friend um, last night. So there's a documentary about Toastmasters that came out a few years ago and it is, is really good. Um, it, I love, I love Toastmasters. My husband and I did it for a while together. Uh, we, we were preparing for a speech that we were going to give on a stage together. And so we're like, okay, well we got to get ready. I mean, I, I can go on any stage and like, I'm just like an extrovert who can, I could talk forever. You know me, my husband, not so much. My husband's a total introvert and it took, it took, um, a lot of personal growth and development to get him to the point where he was comfortable going on stage in front of, in front of thousands of people. So, uh, so it was a great experience, but I, I, I really enjoyed Toastmasters. And what I like is it's so accessible. I love a bunch of other, you know, personal growth and development courses out there. You know, there's a course of miracles that you, you could find a group that's studying course of miracles. There's, you know, um, unity church, you know, if you want to, if you want something that's sort of like a spiritual, but non denom like there's no particular religion, it's just spiritual. You can find lots of courses that they do. Um, there's a, a um, landmark education, which is like, it is worldwide, but these, these things aren't, necessarily as accessible because maybe some of the costs money like uh, or a lot of money like you know certain personal growth courses or maybe it's not near you or maybe it doesn't align with you spiritually but what I love about Toastmasters is that everyone anyone can do it as long as I don't remember the age in which you can start but I think teenagers can start um, I think maybe 14 is the age but um, I, I love that it is it's it's so accessible. It's in every city and it's run by the group. So, the, you know, it's they give you a format and that it's it's non judgmental, And you, you you can get the for your first class, even if you're an introvert, you can get up there and you can say, you know, three sentences about yourself. And that's how you start, you know, um, but that's a great if anyone's looking for just some general personal growth, join a Toastmasters. And if you don't necessarily jibe with the people that are in that one group, there's another Toastmasters meeting three blocks away. <laughs> that might be a totally yeah. different demographic. We joined a demographic. We went to Redmond, Washington, because it was just south of us and it happened to be a really good time. And it was like t a Tuesday lunch time right and so everyone in our group was uh an employee at the city of redmond or was in microsoft and so very different mentality from up the street there was an evening toastmasters and there was like a bunch of really cool hip people you know like you know college kids and all that in that one so you get a totally different feel for depending on what location and what time of day um are, and now you can actually i know you're you're preparing for being uh, on a ted talk uh, but you can actually participate in in a global contest, a Toastmasters global contest where you could be the Toastmaster of all the world. Yeah, I know. It's it's actually really exciting. I um they just did that and I was like a little too new. I hadn't even done my icebreaker speech yet. But it is so accessible. Like there are people in there that uh are have English as a second language and they have a very heavy accent to people that uh, one guy that just got back from uh, New Zealand where he was he had gotten a job for six months as a paid speaker for this particular company. And so there's all different levels, which means you feel more comfortable. It's only ninety dollars for six months and you can actually come as a guest as as much, often as you want before you ever pay to be a member and you still get to kind of participate in table topics and stuff like that. So it is a really, really cool organization and I can see why it's lasted this long. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard as adults to make friends, you know, and to meet, you know, it was really easy in school because, you know, if you go to a traditional school, you're kind of forced to be, here's 29 other kids. You have to spend six hours a day with them. Go. And uh, so, it's you know, we're forced to be in a, a group where we're, where we're playing together as kids, but when we're adults, you know, some of us work from home. Some of us are home, like our stay at home parents. And as long as, you know, if you're, or you're, you're maybe you're working 
but you don't like working with a company, but you don't really connect with your coworkers. You don't want to really socialize with them. And so it's sort of hard to make new friends um, outside of, you know, outside of school. And it, it seems kind of like a really lonely place once we graduate. And, and then, you know, so finding these kind of like, you know, going to meetup.com and, or joining Toastmasters and you, you can start to connect with like-minded people, especially the community that of people that want, that are interested in growth, that are interested in expanding themselves and, and, and challenging themselves. Yeah, I'm a strong believer in being really selective on who you spend your time with because people are either going to lift you up or drag you down. And that's probably one of the biggest things I've noticed from my growth is when I'm, when you're working on yourself kind of as much as I am, cause I get so passionate about it. Like from one year to the next, I've made some huge strides and I have grown out of a lot of people, people that have been in my life for a long time. And it's weird the way it works. I think it's a, it's a really, it, it seals my beliefs of just attracting like energy and things like that, because all of a sudden something seemingly really dumb that shouldn't like come in the way of a 10 year friendship will happen. And somebody just falls out of your life for whatever reason. And that's been happening with a, a few close friends. But I also find that the more I, I chase my passion, I have been getting emails and phone calls from people from my past that all of a sudden want to be in my life that are seeing what I'm doing with my podcast. And I had a friend from high school that called me to tell me she's proud of me and things like that. And so it, it's been really cool when you, when you are finding your own light and shining that it's infectious for people. Another thing that I'm really fortunate is I'm in Santa Monica. And so uh, there's just so many cool things that go on. And I highly encourage people to check out like Facebook events or meet up, like you said, because there is cool stuff going on everywhere. When I travel, I try to do events. And and one of those things that's happening in L.A., New York and San Francisco right now is a new women's group that started called Quilt. And the domain is wequilt.com. And I'm a part of it. It's really an expensive monthly thing. It's like $19 a month to be a part of this and they've got like little coffee and chats in the morning and they'll have a theme around money or journey and it's just women coming together to have a conversation and to start their day that way they also have learn shops so i'm hosting a podcasting workshop with them and and uh it's it's been a lot of fun but i think you do have to make the effort to go out and find those people and now i just feel so blessed to be surrounded by so many people that are um that are are encouraging of what I'm doing that accept the changes that I'm making. One thing that I've really noticed, um, I had a friend recently who she said a few different things that I like, one of them was I was talking about my passion for this and, and she just had to slip in a little comment. Like, uh, cause I'm like, I know that this one's going to last. Like, this is just so I'm so passionate about it, blah, blah. And this was like the first couple of months of me starting my podcast. And she's like, yeah, I mean, well, it's still early, but like little con little comments like that, that can get into your head. And you're like, wait, what if this is still early? What if, what if I will give up those things? You have to be aware, even when they're small of not allowing that to kind of get into your energy, redirect your flow. Uh, another thing was like somebody once said, um, cause we went on a trip together and I didn't bring my self journal, which I write in every single day and I'm all passionate about it. And she ended up buying one. And then I didn't bring it. Cause I was like, well, it's all about my goals. And I wanted to just kind of release and wasn't the best idea for me, given that routines are such a big part of my, my, uh, my life changes, like just being okay from my eating disorder and stuff like that. But she's just like, I don't know, or is your self growth fake? And that started to get into oh my, my head. Gosh. Like, no, you know what? Everything, everything might feel fake at first. First of all, whenever you make a change, it might feel fake. You're building a new habit. And so it's those kinds of people that I feel like you just have to drop, you know, mm -hmm. even if they've been in your life, if it doesn't mean you need to drop them forever, it doesn't mean you need to be judgmental or anything back, but it's like, you also need to realize that like you have a limited amount of energy and so to use it wisely and don't let energy vampires suck that out of you. 
and and they're trying to it's like crab in the bucket like how how do you how do you catch crabs if you put one crab in a bucket it's going to crawl out if you put two crabs in a bucket at the same time they won't crawl out because as one tries to crawl out the other one will pull the other one back down yes and it's like yes that's exactly how i feel and it's funny because that same person used to kind of be my with some other friendships falling off um and be like, oh yeah, that, that person's crazy. And she was kind of my confidant. And so it was a weird shift for me to realize like, okay, you know what? Like not everyone is meant to be around forever and people have their purpose up to a certain time. And, and it's okay to let go of not only people, but also new habits. I think people even get into their head. Like an example is somebody that like used to, used to, snowboard or used to skydive and then they like move on to something new like you don't always have to stick with absolutely everything some things <laughs> some things uh serve their purpose and then it's time to move on and explore more parts of this magical universe right like your friend's weird comment about well it's still early this idea like okay you're starting a podcast like who who says we have to do something for 40 years and then get a gold watch once we retire from it? Like this, right. that is such a weird mentality. I can, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur now nine years and I can't tell you how many different things I've done, but I don't see anything as a failure. I see everything as learning. I mean, I can think of a project that I didn't, I didn't launch, for example, um, but I ended up learning an entirely new way of video editing that I'm so grateful for having learned because I'm self-taught. I'm an autodidact, just like, you know, yourself, you're, yourself, you're clearly self-taught. So, you know, those who are listening to a podcast, they're more inclined to be an autodidact who want to learn things on their own. And, and it takes, and I never call it a failure because none of them were. I can think of every little venture and everything that I've tried and everything I've, 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 I've uh, all the projects I've worked on the last nine years have built my skill set. I, I taught myself how to video edit. Like I taught myself how to, like, I'm, I'm the only one doing this. I mean, my husband helps me with some, with some technical stuff and he's my rock and he's like the whole reason why I, you know, was able to even do this podcast. But like I do the interviews, I, you know, learned how to do interviews. I learned how to video or how to audio edit. I learned how to like get it all up there. I learned how to promote it. You know, like all that stuff is just, if I hadn't have done the last nine years of all the other projects. And if someone was, one of my friends was standing there going, well, that's a failure. Like, well, well, look, look what you did. You, you know, oh, that didn't last. Like I would not have, <laughs> I wouldn't still be doing this if I had let people in my life that stood there and said, well, that didn't last. I remember, um, my, my, uh, father-in-law, when, when my husband and I launched a, a new, a new way of making money for ourselves, um, let's see, it was back in 2011, early 2011. And we were so excited about it. We we're like, oh, wow, the money's just starting to come in. You know, my our customers are excited. We got so excited about it. And you know what he said? He goes, that we were telling him about all the process. We we're telling him about how it works. He goes, he goes, he said something really weird. He goes, don't tell me about the labor pains. Show me the baby. Meaning we hadn't shown him enough results. And so I remember back when I launched the podcast, like that's his attitude. So I really don't spend a lot of time with him uh, because anytime I share anything positive about my life, he's going to tear it down. And sure enough, when I started sharing the podcast with him, when I first launched it, I'm like, Hey, I got, you know, this many downloads and we, we hit like within, within days, uh, or it was like less than three weeks, um, of launching the podcast. We hit number one in iTunes in the health section and in science and medicine and number two in education in the new and overly section and, and our podcast stuck there. It's still there. And I go to my father-in-law and I'm telling him this stuff and, and he just goes, well, that's not a lot of people. You know, I'm like telling him about like tens of thousands of people that have listened to the show. And he's kind of like, that's, that's nothing. And I'm looking at him like, well, what have you done? Like how, <laughs> how many people have you helped in your life? Like, you know, I could, and I, now I tell him, like we have three million downloads and he kind of, he just tries to find a way to put it down and tries to find a way. He goes, well, if you divide that by all your, 
your episodes, you only have this many or whatever. Like he just tries to put it down and it's amazing. And now I know what he's doing. So I, I just don't, I don't go to him for, you know, motivation. I don't go to him to share, uh, unrealized creations. That's another thing. Don't share with your friends and family, your, 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 the dreams you have in your head that are, aren't born yet. You know what I mean? And pick, pick very, be very careful who you share your unrealized creations with because like the crab in the bucket, your sister, your best friend, your mom, they might love you just to bits, but they might love you so much that they have their own fears in life. And they're so afraid of you falling flat on your face that if you share an unrealized creation, like I'm going to learn how to be a skydive instructor, or I'm going to, I'm going to write a book or I'm going to be on a Ted talk. And then their fears come in to play. And then they try to tell you about all their fears. Like, Oh, well, what if you hurt yourself? And what if you get laughed at? And what if you forget your lines and da, 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 da. And, and, and meanwhile, they think they're loving you for telling you all the big things that could go wrong. But what they just did was completely burst your bubble and, and take all of the, like they sucker punched you, you know what I mean? Take, just take all the wind out of you. And so Really, I love that you're saying be very careful who you let in your life, especially be very careful who you share your dreams and aspirations with. Um, and, and, you know, make sure that, you know, who you share it with is your partner, your rock and someone who no matter what will absolutely just advocate for you and, and stand by you and only use language that that lifts you up because there are no failures in life. The only failure is if is if you were unwilling to dust yourself off and, and gain the positive learnings that you could apply into the future. For sure. And I think one of the things that I've really realized is there's two things is, is that first of all, people oftentimes they don't mean to be that crab in the bucket. Like you said, <laughs> it's like they might love you so much, but it's like, Notice the difference of when you talk to somebody that has just had their safe nine to five job forever, <laughs> barely made to retirement compared to somebody that has made millions on their ventures. You can tell the craziest idea to a successful person and they will say, yes, of course you can do it and, and give you direction on how to get there. You talk to like, you know, your, <laughs> my, my stepdad who, I remember talking to him about, uh, I had done a travel blog for a while. That was one of my first, uh, little ventures before I realized I hated writing about travel. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important to do the work before yes. do the work and figure out what actually is going to fit into your life and what you're going to want to do rather than just the rewards. Like, Oh, who doesn't want to fly first class and travel for free and all this stuff sounds amazing. Oh wait, I've got to write about travel. <laughs> it's a big thing to realize. But I remember saying like, Oh yeah, there's these people and they're doing these things. And I was just kind of starting to explore these new ways of passive income and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, but you have to have a job. And you know, he doesn't mean anything by it. He's such a supportive person, but he's um, a retired police officer. That's never gotten a ticket that just has those little routines and <laughs> likes to over explain how to go to Costco and things like that, you know, <laughs> like he's got it. And so knowing who to go to for certain things. And, and then the, the second thing is, is, Understanding that um, not to take things that people say personally, they can say something actually hurtful to, to you, like what what my friend said to me, and then realize that this it's sad. You have compassion for that person because that how they talk to you, you've got to imagine how they're talking to themselves. You know, it's probably 10 times worse their self-talk to themselves. And I know that that particular person is a little bit lost right now and I get it. And so a lot of her things that she is saying to herself or she's projecting. And so to, to kind of realize that and to, to keep your head strong on where you want to be and trust yourself and the process, because you might get into something like, like for example, my travel blogging. And, and I also tried an affiliate site and, and then I had to stop and I was like, okay, this should have been easily avoidable. Go back and do the work. And I, read Will It Fly by Pat Flynn, which is a really great book on not only finding your purpose, but also validating your business idea. And so I had to sit there and write in quadrants, like what I'm good at, what people come to me for. And one of the, and one of the things was, what is my 
perfect, perfect day look like? Well, Mm. my perfect day would like, this probably would have saved me months of travel blogging, realizing that I don't want to be on the top of Machu Picchu taking selfies. I want to be living (laughs) in the moment, you know? And so, uh, what does my perfect day look like? Where do I see myself in 10 years? And then one of the biggest game changers for me was, um, what was called the shark bait test, where you write a letter to a bunch of people that, you know, So I wrote a letter to 11 people in different walks of my life. Like one person works at my co-working space and I helped him with his pitch deck. And one person was an old roommate and one person was my mom and one person was an old boss. And I asked them what they saw in me, what my superpower was. And this was one of the big aha moments to finding my podcast because six different people wrote in almost the exact same words that I was good at bringing information from a ton of sources, organizing it and explaining it to people. I knew that I was driven and I knew that I loved to learn and all of this stuff, but that was a really big game changer for me because suddenly it took me from one process of thinking to a completely different and seeing something that I thought was a failure and turning it into a gift. Because the, what I thought was a failure was that I thought I was too curious. I was one moment skydiving, one moment in yoga, one moment in Reiki, one moment travel blogging. And I just wanted to learn and take all of this information from life. And I'm like, well, maybe I can do this with my life and maybe I can do this with my life. And then I started to look at it as wait, well, how can I continue to bring in information from a lot of sources and deliver it and explain it to people? And how can this be a stepping stone on my bigger goal of being on that TED Talk stage? How can I start to get speaking experience now without any experience of, without needing to validate to somebody like, oh, well, yes, invite me to talk on your stage. I have no experience yet, but I need to get it somehow. Well, now I get to talk to people. I get to continuously learn. And so I did the work to figure out what my perfect little path would be. And I really encourage people to go back and and take those steps. I used to think that just because I was always learning that it was automatically being applied to my life. But that's the other thing is that just because you keep reading about meditation doesn't mean you have a meditation practice. So you also have to make time to apply it. I love it. I love it. It's so cool. I love that you were on that journey. Now, you did some blogging with the travel blog. So did you take those skills? Did you already, did you learn anything from that? Like, did you learn, did you become better at, at, at WordPress? Did you become better at blogging? Did you become better at writing? Did you hone any skills while you were, you know, someone might call that a failed venture, but it, but it, it wasn't if you gained a bunch of skills from it that now you're using, right? Yeah. And I actually, I had digital marketing experience already. I had been kind of like when you were talking about all of these different things that you had had tried and like learned to do videos and stuff like that. I started to teach myself digital marketing back in 2009. Nice. But okay. So I told you in the beginning of my story that I had landed in jail for my ex-boyfriend's crime. Yeah. Yeah. I do you want me to tell that? Story? Yes, tell it. <laughs> okay. So um, there were a number of things that led up to the ultimate fail and like having just crazy blinders on. I met this guy and I had just moved back from Texas and I, he was just very happy go lucky. He gave me a book called The Mastery of Love by Don Miguel Ruiz, which is still one of my favorite books. And it was just all about like not letting people affect you. And, and it was kind of a path to happiness. And so he was very nonchalant and I, and uh, just kind of easygoing and, and I attributed it to that book. Well, that, that weekend after I met him, his dad also died and my dad died and I had all this guilt from that. And so I, I also started to make excuses for his behavior. It took me months to realize that this person was addicted to meth. I noticed when he wasn't on meth that something was wrong because when he was on meth, that was his norm and he had been on it for years. But here's the kicker. So he was also cheating on me and that was what I was focusing on. More so was the cheating and I would make excuses for him because so he was depressed and his dad died and, and all of this stuff. And I, and I saw this under layer and I thought like I was the only person who loved him enough to, to help him through it and stuff like that. And so 
I was so blind to the fact that he was also robbing houses. And so he used to do real estate with his dad and um, he would do loans. And so because of that, he had access to the MLS reports, which are basically reports for realtors that say, oh, this person is gone from nine to five and this person um, doesn't live there anymore. And, um, and so the house, the furniture in there is for show. They live somewhere else or whatever it was. So he knew when people were going to be home and when they weren't. And these houses had lock boxes on them. So he would take bolt cutters and and clip the bolt cutters, take it to his car, put a, or clip the lock box, take it to his car, put a screwdriver in it and shimmy out the key. This guy drove a Benz, dressed nice. Nobody ever once called in on sus- uh, for suspicion because they were used to realtors coming and there was a Benz parked in the <laughs> driveway. It wasn't some shady guy. And so, and he'd just walk in, take the jewelry and leave. Well, when he was, he started to get sloppy because his drug addiction was getting worse. He was sinking lower. Uh, he lived in the desert area. And so he was gambling all of the money that he was making, basically taking people's like life savings and then gambling it away in minutes and pawning all this jewelry. It was crazy. I, I knew something was up, but I thought I blamed the the cheating and the depression. And at one point I went back to Hawaii where I had used to live and I stayed there for five weeks. I got back and he had said that he had gotten some money from his mom to get his jewelry business back up the ground, off the ground, because mind you, that's what he would take. He would take the jewelry and then he would sell it on eBay. So (laughs) it's all even trackable. It was crazy. But, and so I would see his eBay accounts and he'd be making like 50 grand in a week or in a month and stuff like that. He was making a lot. And um, anyways, I get back and, and I'm almost like giving him another chance. Cause I was also at my low point. Don't forget. And so I, I wasn't strong enough to just be like, no, I don't deserve this. And we're in his car and all of a sudden we're arrested and they had been watching him for a while. And it was almost like, if you've seen home alone, the wet bandits or the sticky bandits by season <laughs> by the set, the sequel of it where they could then tell because he had done it the same way at every house. They knew every single house that he got. So while I was in Hawaii, he was also cheating on me with somebody and he had asked to pick up my dog. My mom was watching my dog. He was like, I miss Maverick. Can I go get him? And I was like, sure. Why not? Like I picked up my dog and he would sometimes stay in some of these houses that were vacant for like a couple of days. Cause they had, they were normally furnished for showing and stuff like that. And My dog was pooping in the house because he wasn't taking him out. And and so there were two witnesses of a blonde girl and this little dog. Oh, no. I had the proof. I had a plane ticket. I was in Hawaii. All my debit card statements were in Hawaii. And I ended up being... um, I ended up having to come back. I moved to LA to get away from him. He actually ended up following me, throwing a brick through my windshield at one point. It was like a nightmare, but I was going to court every month and the date kept being pushed back for two full years. He had a very expensive attorney. I had whatever I could afford. My attorney didn't even show up to 50% of the court dates. And so then I was just like with him and his mom and his attorney being kind of coached on what I should do. I was too embarrassed to have my stepdad and my mom involved, my retired police officer stepfather, my mom who worked at a church. I had like never gotten in trouble like this. And long story short, I ended up getting to the point of I could take it to trial or I could I could let it or let him take a deal. And if it took a deal, we'd both take a deal and I would have a felony on my record, but I wouldn't get any time. I would owe a little amount of restitution, but he'd get time served. And if I didn't, I'd take it to trial. And it was almost guaranteed that he was going to get at least 10 years in jail. So I took a felony. And the crazy thing is, is when somebody's on a negative path, like he was, he kept robbing houses. He got off on a scotch free, like no he got time served for being in rehab, which is why I know so many of the details. Cause he was on the step of like coming clean with everything. And he told me all about it. And then, um, but then he kept robbing houses and he's in jail to this day. He got nine years with a minimum of seven and a half served. And he might be getting out sometime soon. Actually, this was a long time ago. <laughs> it's crazy. But, um, but as that was the craziest thing that's ever happened to me, I believe. And, 
I have to be thankful for it because what that did is it propelled me into entrepreneurship. I was not, I had never had a problem getting jobs before that. Mm. And I was not about to go apply for a job and have to write that I had a felony and explain this crazy long story that I just explained to you. And so I, I took it. I thought it was never like, it, I'm thankful to where it hasn't affected me. Like I've actually had some jobs. I was working for a startup. I tell people about it now. It's part of my story. Um, but people get to know me and it's just so opposite of who I am that it doesn't <laughs> really like scare them away from me. But, um, but then recently it's interesting how things work, but I was going to New Zealand with my friend or no, I was going to Australia with my friend and we get to the airport and suddenly like I didn't do my due diligence on what everything I'd need. And um, I get to the airport and my visa's denied because of my felony. And it sent me kind of on a spiral. It was like a punch in the face from my past and it even almost triggered my eating disorder. It was a mess, but it's crazy the way life works out. And now <laughs> I'm just like, you just have to be thankful for the journey, no matter what mm -hmm. you're going through. And it's really highlighted for me that you might not realize the purpose of something until even 10 years down the road, or maybe mm -hmm. you're never fully clear, but just trust the process and know that if you are, if you have good intentions, if you are willing to take the actions that all of this is part of your journey and it's meant for your highest purpose. <laughs> and mm -hmm. It's just all the process. Exactly. I love, I love that you, you're saying you've got to, no matter what's happened to you, you've got to look for the positives and the learnings may not, you may not understand why, but it, there is a reason. I really do believe that there, there's a, a God given path for us, that there's a divine intervention for example, I figured out like if I hadn't had this fertility issue because I had polycystic ovarian syndrome and infertility, I probably would have never like I probably would have ended up, you know, uh, getting pregnant, marrying the guy that I was with in Canada who we were together for five years. I probably would have stayed in Canada. We would have not had lasted because he ended up being a real creep, but I would have definitely had a kid with him. And that would have, I would have never, you know, I would have stayed in Canada for sure, would never have moved to the States, would never have met my now husband. We've been married this year. This year is our 10th year. And, and been, you know, like I've just, I'm in love with my life. Right. And so I just see like, you know, yes, I suffered for many years and I could focus on being a victim and suffering, or I could go, wow, I'm really thankful that I had this happen so in such a way that allowed me to now be with uh, who I'm with and I love who I am now. And of course, there's things I want to, I want to grow, right? I'm not, I'm never done growing. There's definitely things I'm still working on with my own body and my own health and my own life and my own personal growth, but I can, I can add up all the things I'm grateful for. And, and it does take, it does take that skill. Like you said, the five minute journal, it does take being intentional about, Having more things you're grateful for, the more things you're complaining about, for sure. And then being really grateful for those negative things that happened to you in the past. Having lost both my parents, and I've had to do the personal growth work to, to heal, to heal from that. And not that I'm saying I'm grateful my parents died, but I can be so grateful for who I am now and the lessons I've learned and, and how far I've come and everything that I went through. Um, I'm really grateful for being able to hold my mom's hand as she died. I'm, I'm really grateful for the six years I got with my dad after my mom died before he died and that we became really close, like really best friends. And I, I would not have had that any other way. And so, um, I can just look at, like, I could just tell you how crappy it is, right? We could just talk about how horrible that is and only focus and complain on the negatives, but there's no personal growth there. There's no, you know, there's really no gain to that. Well, what's the return on investment by focusing on and complaining on what we don't want to have? Instead, exactly. we can put 99% of your focus, like, okay, do a little 1% complaining, go, this is what I don't want to have in my life. Because I think it's also important to understand what you don't want to have, but don't put any energy behind it. Sort of like dating. Like I dated for years before I found my husband and I kept going every time there was a, you know, 
not my husband that I dated, right? It was like, okay, this isn't the one. Well, that's great. It's like Edison and a thousand different light bulbs that don't, like he just discovered a thousand different ways that not to make a light bulb, right? But every single date I learned from, I figured out, like I just honed my ability to communicate, to like decipher what I want and, and, and to decipher what I don't want. Sometimes we have to even date or sometimes marry, people to figure out what we do and we don't want just like you have to like actually jump into a job or 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 you know a career or even go out and get a degree and actually live it to realize wow this isn't what i wanted but i had you can't you can't ex you can't know if you really want it until you experience it you know it's like if you've never ever gone downhill skiing how do you know if you like downhill skiing over snowboarding like, how do you know which one you really, really like until you actually put your boots in the snowboard or the skis and try it? And so that's life. Life is an action sport, you know, like we have to be in it and can't think of anything in the past as a failure. Just gain the lessons and be really grateful. And I love that you're focused on that and you, 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 life is still going to sucker punch us once in a while. But if you, in that moment, take a deep breath and focus on what you're grateful for and focus on the positive lessons and then apply those to your future, you're so much better off. And I love that you do that. And you never know what the, like, what if, what if it was a divine intervention of like, what if something bad would have happened when I got right. there? If I right. would have got that, you never know the full reason, but I'm also a big, I've been, I've gotten really grateful for restrictions these days. And here's why, because, okay, so I used to almost pride myself on being indecisive until I realized indecision is actually a form of pain. <laughs> it's, it's not, uh, it's not a happy thing. Like you shouldn't be like, Oh yeah, I can never decide things. No, just, just make a decision. And so p some of these things are, are, um, like I said before, where I'm grateful that it propelled me into entrepreneurship. Suddenly, these things that I might have fallen back on because I have been able to get jobs. I am good at getting jobs. I, I excel in interviews and I learn fast and stuff like that. And I could have ended up making good money. But what if then I'm not shining the light that I was truly meant to shine here in this lifetime, which I think I'm finding now. Same with being vegan. It's so much easier to order at restaurants now because <laughs> there's normally one or two vegan things on the menu. You right? know? It's like it just saves time. I know exactly what I, what I need to get. And, and I like what you said about, about just kind of figuring out the wrong ways to make a light bulb too, because another, another good visual for that is missiles, those big missiles that shoot like thousands of miles. What the way that they work is they actually figure out their path, not by just following, following one path, but by overcorrecting. So they'll go the wrong way and then it, it'll sense and it'll kind of shift them back to where they're supposed to go. And that is exactly how those things move is through overcorrecting. And that's what we do in this life. It's not some straight path. We're going to be going around trees and over mountains and, and have to cut some stuff down and swim through the river to get to where we're going. There's not just a straight path for any goal. And when you can realize that and just take it and enjoy the journey and look for what you're grateful for along the way, figure out what parts of it that you like and focus on those, then your life experience just changes. Give us some tips for enjoying the journey and getting out of the gray zone, getting out of that. I, I like you talked about habits, but sometimes people get like your, your routine is being a good routine. Like you like your routine. Sometimes people get in a routine though. That's like get up, go to work, come home, go to sleep over and over again. And all of a sudden, like five years have gone by and they're not following their passion anymore. Maybe they're just really busy, like raising their kids and focusing on the, the goals for their children. But then they realize they've lost themselves and they, they don't remember the last time they ever had a goal for themselves. You know, they just get caught up in that day to day routine without they're sort of in the gray zone. You know what I mean? So how do we shake things up, get people so that they're actually like living their passion and then loving that being in the moment, like being grateful day to day. This is where I really rely on my tools. And so like I had mentioned, no, I'm not some sort of sponsor for them. They have no idea who I am, the self journal. <laughs> but I, I just love that thing. And it's funny because I just mentioned it to my friend. I had mentioned it a while before. 
but I had said something about my self journal and my friend Bridget was like, dude, that thing changed my life. And it's really good at, at helping to guide those things because there's, there's a weekly review and you can kind of plan out your month. And, and what it does is, is it helps you first in the morning focus on three things you're grateful for as well as at night. It also has spots to set three goals for the day. A lot of us have these long to-do lists and, and you can have a hundred things on there and you might even finish like 15, which is a lot of tasks to finish in a day, but it's really hard not to see the 85 that you haven't finished (laughs) when you're looking at a list like that. And so when you're picking three three things each day, then it forces you to be more strategic on those things that are going to actually move you towards your goal rather than just picking whatever's easier. And then another big part of it is, is, uh, it, it has lessons learned that you can write down, which I I really love because it forces you to kind of acknowledge where you could have, where you could have gone better or even something that did go right, but like something that you want to keep with you. And I think the biggest part is tracking your wins and your accomplishments. Those are addicting and it makes you want to accomplish even more. But it also, there's so many days that maybe I did accomplish three things. Maybe I got a really cool guest on my podcast or got in, interviewed by a really cool podcast like yours. And, but then my website crashed or something like that. Or then I, got a bill in the mail for a ticket I forgot to pay and it sends me down a spiral. It can be easy to have those things overtaking the good that you're doing. But when you are forced to write down the good things that happen, then suddenly you're like, wait, I did do some good things today. And some people might not be so Mm. focused on some big building an empire like I feel like I want to do. It might even just be like, how well they did with their kids that day, like what they, how they encouraged their daughter to not give up on tying her shoe. It doesn't matter. It's what's important to you and what brings you joy. But all these little things are just shifting your focus and, and disrupting those kind of neural loops of that we get into. I think that's the biggest, the most important part is to disrupt and design your life. You it helps you to kind of stop and be aware. What are my patterns? How does my day go? Where can I fit in some time for myself? I have recently, finally, after so many years of trying to develop a really consistent meditation practice and almost feeling like a fraud, like being having so much mindfulness. Mindfulness is such a big part of my life. But like I said before, just because you read about it doesn't mean you have the practice. And recently I've kind of had a breakthrough. And so before I turn my phone off of airplane mode, I've been, I've been meditating for 20 minutes every day. This helps to clear your head and define stillness. It's been scientifically proven that the people that meditate basically have more control over over their emotions and and things like that. There's so much emerging studies that have been coming out on the power of meditating, even if it's just for one minute. I had a guest come on and she could not meditate for 20 minutes in a sitting. So she would stop and, and do three minutes, three times a day. And it helped her overcome alcoholism. And so finding time for yourself, even if it's on the toilet, (laughs) just closing your eyes and trying to find stillness. Normally for me, the first 10 minutes are thoughts. I'm like, is this meditating even working? I'm just like going through the annoying things that happened or whatever. But then all of a sudden (laughs) it's like the last couple minutes that I'll find that stillness and it feels better than a nap. So the stillness in the morning is important to me. I've also recently started journaling, which kind of helps me slow down my thoughts to the speed of which I can write, which has been really helpful and actually like coming to logical conclusions. And then I plan my day. I make sure to get those three things that are going to move me towards my goal written down and actually schedule them in time slots. Because if you just have three things, you time. And, um, and yeah, I try to check in with my progress, acknowledge the good that I'm doing and sometimes look back and see how far I've come. Nice. I love it. So this is self journal. Who's it by? Is it on Amazon? How do we get it? 
Yeah, it's um, you can go to bestself.co. And it's just, it's my favorite little journal. I started with um, something called the passion planner, but it, there just wasn't enough room to write for each day. And I feel like the best self journal has exactly, exactly the things that keep me motivated. And, and I've been hearing a lot of really great feedback from people that I've shared it with as well. Awesome. What a great tip. You're just so full of them. Now you're podcast so far 20 now you do a you do it's very it's a heavily edited show it's like listening to an npr interview it's you know it's it's a beautiful show so you have 25 episodes you put a lot of effort into it and really great guests out of all the 25 episodes what's your favorite one so far I mean, it's hard to say because I feel like with each new like when I release a new one all of a sudden my passion goes there but um, I have had some some two of my most inspiring people was a woman named Cheryl Hunter and her episode was on resilience. And she grew up in a really small town and just dreamed of getting out. She'd watch uh, planes flying overhead. And and so finally she saved up her money. And when she was 19, she went to Europe and was going to try to be a model. And she went with a friend. And when she got off the plane, these two men came up and they're like, oh, we can help you be a model. And her friend's like, no way are we getting in the car with you. She ended up sneaking out later by herself to meet up with these guys thinking it was her big break. And they abducted her. And <gasps> all the terrible things that you can imagine happen happened. They even cut off her hair. And then they left her in a park for dead three days later. And she ended up uh, surviving finding her way home and it led her on this whole journey of resilience. And now it's like 20 years later, but she helps other people to overcome obstacles. That was a big one. My other favorite one was uh, Leanna, uh, a woman named Leanna Strelkoff. And she was a lifelong dancer and actress. And she was on a, one of her first dates with a new guy and they were hiking in Malibu and she climbed a tree and the branch broke and she fell 30 feet and <gasps> is paralyzed from the waist down now. And that was, she. I mean, she was a lifelong dancer. She lived to move and suddenly everything changed. And it somehow she, in her words, she says it turned her life into gold. It, it became, her life became happier. It showed her her purpose. And now she motivates people to get over things like that. And my most recent favorite is Carrie, Carrie Otis Sutton, who is just on this most recent episode. And I think it's such a powerful episode because first of all, uh, some of our more age mature listeners might remember her. She was a, a famous, a really famous supermodel in the eighties and nineties. And she made, was in the tabloids all the time for her tumultuous marriage with uh, Mickey Rourke. And um, she wrote a book called Beauty Disrupted, and, and it talks about her struggle with addiction and her eating disorder and all of this stuff. But one the most, the thing that really I love talking about was, I um, hope this is okay to mention, but faking orgasms and how that really just takes away your self-worth and how big of a problem it is. There's so many women, and it was a, actually a very personal story to me as well. I we don't, a lot of women just don't think that they're worth the extra time that it takes. Don't realize oh that gosh. sex isn't just about the male ejaculation. And, and they, for a long time, I, I was ashamed to say that I couldn't orgasm through intercourse. Mm. And the fact is that 80% of women can't. And if what? you are, it's 80% of women don't orgasm through intercourse or have a very difficult time and end up finally having a breakthrough. But uh, sexual pleasure for women comes from the clitoris. And if you are, if you are orgasming through intercourse, then what that means is that it's able to be simulated from the base on the inside or from the base on the outside through rubbing. And women who I have opened up in the last few years, I've opened up about this to so many female friends who have ended up breaking down and being like, I thought something was wrong with me. Women don't want to be the person that the man that they don't want to emasculate the man and they don't want to be the one woman that the man can't get off. And so, uh, it was just a really intense discussion that I've like, I, I get very passionate about. Um, so yeah, we have all sorts of, of guests on that just 
kind of open your eyes to a different way to look at things, um, share struggles or either, either overcome or achieve something from a shift in mindset and even like expand your mindset on different belief systems, like whether it be, uh, Ayurveda, um, as like a nutritional system or a way of life or, or astrology or, uh, intuition and psychics and, and stuff like that. So, I just really aim to help people expand their consciousness. Nice. I love it. Thanks for bringing up that statistic about orgasms. Um, that's really interesting. And I, I can see, I'm not to get into too much detail. I'm so happy. I'm so thankful for my husband. We really are meant to be together. We're like perfect fit, but every other person that I was with before him was not a perfect fit. And I can see like where some women are just, just fake it just to get it over with because it's not, you know, they're not really into it. But when you find a partner who's like, okay, your needs come first and then mine comes second, or like, you know, it's like a gauntlet. It's like a challenge, you know, like I love men that take on the female orgasm as like their challenge in life. And then it's not about, it's actually not about taking away their masculinity. It's not about, you know, questioning their manhood or whatever. It's just, you know, some that sometimes were more complicated and sometimes men are too. And this is a topic that needs to be discussed in a healthy way. Um, that's actually, I opposed a question to a, our Facebook group, the learn true health Facebook group. I, I said, you know, if I were to host a summit, what, what topic would you want us to explore? Like what, you know, get a bunch of experts together and discuss a topic. And, um, one of our listeners said, uh, sexual women, like sexual health or women's sexual health and, and, and not just like, you know, not STTs, but like sexual health. Like, are we, are we, are we having like as with our partner, a healthy, um, sexual relationship? Uh, cause we really do put that in there. Now having a three-year-old, like we really do put that on the back burner <laughs> once we have kids or we get into our rut, like a rut routine in life. It, um, you know, where did that passion go? Where that connection, where that energy, it's a beautiful and loving energy exchange. And it can be really healing because there's so much emotion wrapped into it. And there's, you know, if you're with a partner, um, it, having that, it's like, it, it can be very healing and loving and beautiful, especially emotionally healing. Um, if you value yourself and you value, like you said, you value yourself enough to, be honest about your relationship and, and then, and then look to grow it, look to grow that aspect of your relationship along with all the other aspects. But I, but I find that when you, as a, when you have a great partner, a great husband or wife, and you take the time to foster a beautiful and loving and, and healthy sexual uh, partnership along with all the other aspects of your relationship, everything else flourishes right? It's just it, everything else in that relationship gets better. It's kind of easier. It's, there's less fighting. It's easier to talk to each other. I don't know what it is about sex, but um, we'll definitely have to have some experts on the show. We'll definitely have to listen to your episode, episode 25 of the Mind Love podcast to learn more about that because it is a beautiful, a beautiful topic to explore and something that's so, it, unfortunately, so still taboo. I know. It's crazy. Like, and there's so much um, trust that comes into women being able to even like orgasms just are more psychological for women. Mm -hmm. And so, and so for her in particular, she had been in such an abusive relationship. Mm. So many people had just, I mean, she was a supermodel. So um, she talks in her book about all of the sexual assault that happened in the modeling industry from a really young age. And so she didn't trust people enough to even understand how to do that with a man. And it was this, she was celibate for five years. It was this long journey of healing and being open and honest with her husband, um, who she met later and just being like, this is my past. This is what I used to struggle with, but I'm not going to fake an orgasm with you. Even if that means that I don't do like, I don't get them. I'm just not going to fake it. That's not like, that's not what I'm going to do. And, and so it was like a lot of work for her of even just sitting there and holding each other and voicing and how like, like, oh, well, now I'm uncomfortable. You held me too long or whatever. And and they worked with a counselor and and got through it. And, and her life is completely different. And so it is just interesting to note that 
and and the way sex works, like women are the ones that are penetrated. And so it's a vulnerable thing and you really have to trust your partner and, Mm -hmm. and trust to be open and have love and compassion for yourself as well in order to achieve these things if it's something that you struggle with. And so, yes, I really, I really loved that episode. I appreciate that you brought up that there it's so emotional and psychological and that trust so it goes beyond just sex right you can't just put things in in a bottle like you can't say okay here's our sexual relationship over here and then here's you know our communication over here and then here's our trust level over here it's all intertwined and um and a healthy sex life helps to foster those other parts because you actually have to work on those other parts to have a healthy sex life. So it's, it's both. It's good. It's good to work on it because you have to open up and communicate and, and build trust and, uh, bring, pull down the walls and let go of the past and forgive and forgive yourself and forgive him. And, you know, so there's so much emotional stuff in it. And, and, and I think for men too, um, you know, but there, I think society brings them up to just be these sexual conquerors that just bang things and there's no emotion, right? Like that's, that's how they see it, you know, in the mainstream, but, but men are vulnerable and cry and have emotions just like women. Actually, I remember talking to a woman a few years ago who was frustrated with her husband and she said something like, well, you know, it'd be easier if he had emotions like a woman. And then I started talking to her because I was like, that's weird. And it turned out she believed, she really believed that men did not have emotions. Like that she was brought up to believe, like in her family, men don't have joy and hate and love and, and, you know, every single, like the spectrum of emotion that women do. And so there are people out there that really believe that men just don't have the same emotions that women. It's just like, this is what we've done. We've built men up to be these sort of robots that aren't supposed to cry and aren't supposed to show vulnerability. And then women are supposed to just like, you know, I, I don't know what, just be passive and give in to men. I don't know. So these, I love that we're in this age right now where we're busting through everything, you know, the me, me too movement, the bringing everything up, the, you know, we're, it's like we're walking into an old room and we're pulling off all these white sheets and, and revealing what's underneath them. You know, we're just, let's get it all out in the open. Exactly. There's this book that I highly recommend to any women. It's called Pussy a Reclamation by this woman who calls herself Mama Gina. And it's the important part about it is it actually goes into the history of women, which I think we've all lost. Like we as American women are thinking about like, okay, well, how many years ago was it that we couldn't vote? And now then we were able to get jobs like men and then all of this stuff. And so it just seems like we're barely like creeping up to equality. (laughs) But in the history of women, women have been powerful beings from the beginning of time. We carry the energy that, that creates life. We create life with our bodies. There's so many powerful things. There this book shares stories of like ancient times when women, like just kind of the power that uh, that was believed that or known that women held. And so I think it's really important to share some of these stories and to shed light on the true history of women, which isn't just like, oh, these little feeble people that used to be in the kitchen. And guess what? Now we can be a CEO. Like that's not how it went down. <laughs> and so to to remind women of their power and to remind them that they're they're they are worth it and to show them that they're not alone and to share these struggles that everyone's going with like I just think it's so important to share your story with people instead of feeling shame instead share and and help somebody else through it I think that if you have come out the other end of a struggle it's your duty to help people to throw a lifeline to those people who are at the beginning of that tunnel and pull them through with you it's how we evolve as a species even faster it's why back in the day uh, evolution was really slow until we had learned to document and cave paintings and teach people even without being there that's when The evolution of our species took an exponential turn and the same thing should happen through recovering from trauma or even just getting through something that you might think is dumb or that it's embarrassing or whatever. Like 
and just don't think that there should be any shame in in this lifetime. We all are just doing the best we can with what we knew at the time. And when we accept that about ourselves, about other people, and instead of judging their stories, just hear it and, you know, show appreciation for their journey. Whether you understand it or not is just a really important part of this life. I love it. I had a visual when you were describing that of like, they would do these things called a, 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 a bee, like where they would raise a barn, like a, I don't know where they call it a barn bee, but they, they, an entire organization like the Amish or an entire, you know, community would get together and in one day build this massive barn, like in one day, this huge feat, uh, whereas it would have taken the one guy or his one family, like it would like him and his sons what i mean it would take them a whole year to build this giant barn and it's just amazing what happens when a community of like 30 or 50 people get together they can build this giant barn in one day and so they anytime someone needed a barn all the farmers got together it was just what you did you know and so i love that you know this idea that like if if all of us who have some experience under our belt f like find and i know that the second I say this is going to make it happen for all of us because that's how like divine intervention works. Once it's in your conscious awareness, once it's in your reticular activating system, that part of that part of your brain that goes and seeks things. When you find someone who's at the beginning of their struggle or journey, or they just came out of it and it's like, wow, you can really relate. And you go, I got some tools that'll help you like, you know, stick your neck out, get a little bit vulnerable and say, Hey, I'd love to, share a meal with you and share, you know, share some wisdom or just hold their hand or just, you know, be there for them. And like you said, pull them through the tunnel because what if our entire society was like that? So the second someone fell, there were 12 people there to pull them back up. And what if we built, built people up instead of tore them down? What if social media, what if the mainstream media, instead of the entire political fight every single day of tearing people down and, you know, oh, Trump said this, Trump said that, and just focusing on negative, negative, negative. What if the entire th system was fed on positives and building people up and supporting people? And if something bad happened, the entire community came came to, to just, just hug them. You know, how different would life be I know. if that's what we did instead of tearing someone down? And I can think of like, you know, like you look at the media and you're like, oh, she's a da-da-da. And look at her. And no, no, no. and we just like complain, complain, complain. Instead of that, like complete opposite. Like, oh, I want to go help that person. Or, oh, my gosh, I saw this story about someone helping someone else. I mean, that is what we should all like. Let's just let's just put all of our energy to that. And if enough of us do it, we can start to make this ripple. Um, it, it'll lower our stress hormones, which will actually help our body heal and create health instead of disease. Like that's the impact that we're doing by focusing on the negatives. I know. And it's, it's a, such a beautiful visual to picture a world like that. But the good news is, is you can create that as your reality, which is what I'm focusing on now and find the people who will be those people for you. Uh, cut out out people that aren't ready to do that let them back in if they are but but like choose the people that you spend your time with when you do that like I look at my life and thankfully I am at a point right now where uh I I mean I had a few extra branches to trim recently <laughs> but uh the people that are around me are so loving and encouraging of my dreams and it's so mm. much easier to just shine my true light and stop trying to be somebody else we're all especially with social media we see all these people with their perfect lives on social media and first of all they've got their struggles too you just might not know what it is you have no idea if they're actually miserable behind that beautiful outfit on the top of a mountain, you know, but like, but the more that we're trying to just mimic other people, like we're never going to shine as bright as that person trying to be that person. You've got to find your own light and discover what's authentically you. And by doing that, it's, it's, it's easier than it sounds. So many people are trying to find themselves. I was trying to find them myself and <laughs> like my whole life, I still am finding myself, but it is a constant journey. And all you really have to do is focus on what brings you joy, figure out ways to bring more of that into your life. Even if you have no idea of how to make a life from it, 
I think a lot of people are like, well, wait, how I work at an accounting firm and blah, blah, blah. And I'm miserable and, or whatever, (laughs) whatever job they have. And they have no idea how to begin to make the changes, but you don't need to just stop and say, okay, well now I'm going to make a living snowboarding. Like it doesn't necessarily work like that, but go snowboarding more often, find other things that kind of light your fire, bring that into your life. The more you can do that, the more you're going to kind of see doors opening for other opportunities. The more you're going to discover more things that you love and the more you're going to just raise your frequency to be at this level of joy and happiness and, and enjoying this life. That's when the same types of things are attracted to you. That's when people like-minded people are attracted to you. And that's when things just really start to open up. I don't know exactly how I'm going to get to my biggest goal, but I'm also going to trust the universe and I'm just going to keep showing up for my own goals, making sure I continuously make progress and then trust that these doors are going to open for me the more I show the universe that I'm ready to take on the challenge. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us so many wonderful steps that we can, baby steps, (laughs) one at a time that we can implement to enrich our lives. And I hope that all my listeners go and check out your podcast, Mind Love. It's been such a pleasure having you here today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a great conversation. I have more energy than when I started, which tells me I was in the right place. Hello, True Health Seeker. Have you ever thought about becoming a health coach? Do you love learning about nutrition and how we can shift our lifestyle and our diet so that we can gain optimal health and happiness and longevity? Do you love helping your friends and family to solve their health problems and to figure out what they can do to eat healthier? Are you interested in becoming someone who can uh, grow their own business, support people in their success? Do you love helping people? You might be the perfect candidate to become a health coach. I highly recommend checking out the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. I just spent the last year in their health coaching certification program and it really blew me away. It was so amazing. I learned over a hundred dietary theories. I learned all about nutrition, but from a standpoint of how we can help people to shift their life and shift their lifestyle to gain true holistic health, I definitely recommend you check them out. You can Google Institute for Integrative Nutrition or IIN and give them a call or you can go to learntruehealth.com slash coach and you can receive a free module of their training to check it out and see if it's something that you'd be interested in. Be sure to mention my name, Ashley James, and the Learn True Health podcast because I made a deal with them that they will give you the best price possible. I highly recommend checking it out. It really changed my life to be in their program and I'm such a big advocate that I wanted to spread this information. We need more health coaches. In fact, health coaching is the largest growing career right now in the health field. So many health coaches are getting in and helping people because you can work in chiropractic offices, doctor's offices, you can work in hospitals, you can work online through Skype and help people around the world. You can become an author, you can go into the school system and help the, the your local schools shift their uh, programs to help children be healthier. You can go into senior centers and, and help them to shift their diet and lifestyle to best support them in their success and their, their health goals. There's so many different available options for you when you become a certified health coach. So check out IAN, check out the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, mention my name, get the best deal, give them a call and they'll give you lots of free information and and help you to uh, see if this is the right move for you. Classes are starting soon. The next uh, round of classes are starting at the end of the month. So you're going to want to call them now and check it out. And if you know anyone in your life who would be an amazing coach, please tell them about it. Being a health coach is so rewarding and you get to help so many people.